its 55 um, scholars of distinction program at Bonnard. Dr. West brought uh, broadly scholarly interest is the relation between societies and the environment. Um, and specifically, the reason we invited um, Professor West today is um, a few months ago we had a, a networking session with um, we had a networking session with um, John Elliot at, from the Flora and Fauna International, um, and she mentioned that we need more arguments from anthropologists in a conservation institute to educate um, the way in which protectors are designed and the, way, the ways in which we approach conservation. We thought that Professor West would be uh, a perfect speaker for that. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to welcome uh, Professor West to present her, her research uh, and her presentation for today. And um, as always, uh, please remain muted. We'll have questions at the end. If you want in the meantime, you can pop them into the chat, but um, we expect the presentation to last 40 minutes. And then the last 20 minutes, we'll have um, time for questions and you'll be allowed to ask them. Um, so please, over to you, Paige. Thank you so much. And thank you all so much for coming today. I know at the end of the year, we are all exhausted and we are all Zoomed out. I am so grateful that we've had Zoom for the past 14 months and it's allowed us to connect with our colleagues like you all and our students. But I would be perfectly happy never to do anything else on Zoom again. So I really appreciate you all taking time to hear me talk. So this will be about 40 minutes. I will share screen. Today I'm going to talk to you about reimagining conservation, decolonization, indigenous sovereignty, and collaboration. And I'll talk a little bit about the place in the world that I work, then I'll talk about my history of working there on conservation as an object of study. And then I'll shift to talking about my contemporary collaborations with John Eine, who's been my research partner for about 12 years. I want to start though by telling you where I live. So I live on the island of Manhattan, which is Lenape land. It's land that was never ceded to anyone. So it is unceded land. And I just wanna take a second to acknowledge the Lenape people as the original people of the land that I live on. My office, I have a lovely office and it's right on the edge of what was a stream. It was a traditional summer hunting area. And it always seems to me that I should acknowledge the indigenous people who held this land in stewardship for so long, given the kind of work that I do with indigenous people in the Pacific. So I'm going to talk today about Oceania, which is a place that I've worked for the past very long time. Let's just leave it at that for a long time. And I'll talk specifically about Papua New Guinea. I won't talk a lot about the biological diversity on the island of New Guinea. All of you know, New Guinea is the second largest island in the world. It sits directly above Australia. Part of it sits the island New Guinea to the north, sits on the equator. It is a mega diverse site, both in terms of terrestrial diversity and in terms of marine diversity. Human migration to New Guinea. I always get this question when I talk to the scientist. So there were a couple of different migrations to the island of New Guinea. The first one, non-Austronesian speakers around 50 to 60,000 years ago. These are the same folks who work, walked across that land bridge that ended up populating the continent of Australia. And then a second migration of Austronesian speakers about 3,500 years ago. These folks came by sailing canoes and they probably came from Taiwan. This is the same migration that populates what people refer to as Polynesia. This is the group that populated the place that I work, New Ireland, um, that I'll talk about today. And I'll come back to why I'm telling you about the different linguistic conventions of the migrations in a minute. So the island of New Guinea has a rich colonial history. Today it's split in half by an international border. The western half of the island is West Papua. It's a settler colony of Indonesia where there's an ongoing genocide. I work on the eastern half of the country, which is Papua New Guinea. The eastern half in the country has a very interesting colonial history. The northern quarter of the eastern half was a German colony, the southern quarter of the eastern half was a British colony. And then when Germany reverted their colonies after the war, the British took over the whole eastern half of the island. And when Australia was ready to have a colony of its own after Australian decolonization, it was ceded to Australia for management. Since 1975, it's been an independent nation. This is Sir Michael Samari. We sadly lost him in February of this year. Sir Michael was the founder of the country. 
Contemporary Papua New Guinea is a parliamentary democracy. The mainland and the islands combined are slightly bigger than California. There are about 9 million residents there. That's a number that is a little bit shaky. I think I saw George Holmes in the audience. Um, so this is a long discussion about how many people really live there. Official population estimates through the census say about 6 million people, but there's some folks who do remote sensing at the University of Papua New Guinea and their estimates are more around 9 million. So to compare for people that think about comparing, this is the same size as California, as I said, and California has about 36 and a half million people. Language matters in New Guinea because the island of New Guinea itself has over a thousand different languages and Papua New Guinea has over 860 different languages. And so this means the indigenous population there is one of the most heterogeneous in the world. People are divided into several thousand separate communities and these communities are divided by language and custom and tradition. These are not dialects. If you count it out in terms of dialects, there are many, many more. These are over 860 different languages. All of these people, about 86% of them, almost all of them live in rural areas. And the majority of these people live in areas with no power and very little access to what we might think of as industrial produced goods. The majority of people in Papua New Guinea, about 75% are shifting horticulturalists who own their own land and who make their living off of their forests, their fields and their reefs for subsistence. So at the very outset of this talk, I will say that the livelihood and the health of Papua New Guineans is directly tied to environmental health there. About 97% of the land is owned by indigenous people. This is of course complicated by mineral extraction rights, which we can talk about in the question and answer period. So how did I get to New Guinea? As a young graduate student, although that is not me young, that is me in 2019 at the top of the fabulous canopy crane in Madang, which if any of you know, sorry about that, if any of you know Papua New Guinea, you may have been too. I came to Papua New Guinea as a graduate student many years ago to think about the relationship between terrestrial systems, conservation, what people know about the world and how people make knowledge about the world, ontology and epistemology. And I kind of had this driving question that you see on the screen. What happens when external ways of knowing, narrating and making the world and nature in particular come into contact with, supplant, overcome or come into conflict with indigenous ways of knowing, making and seeing in Oceania broadly and Papua New Guinea specifically. I ended up to ask these questions working at a place called the Crater Mountain Wildlife Management Area. This was in the early 1990s and at the time the Crater Mountain Wildlife Management Area was the largest protected area on the island of New Guinea and in the country Papua New Guinea. It was a wildlife management area that was started by the Wildlife Conservation Society and it was one of these very early integrated conservation and development projects that was premised on an argument about economic value and biodiversity. Basically the argument went something like this, that people around the world don't value biodiversity the way that we make them value biodiversity, thereby conserving biodiversity, is by creating an economic benefit from biodiversity. I did my work, worked on this project, thinking about what this meant, what, meant, what it meant for this assumption about people not valuing biodiversity to be imported into a place where the indigenous people, Gemi speaking people and Pawaya speaking people, certainly had a way of thinking about biodiversity. And one of the arguments that I made early on was that we can't really use the same way of thinking about value when we think about how indigenous people live with their surroundings and live in their surroundings. That the very idea of value imports a Euro-American notion of economic valuation and that we have to think more broadly about indigenous systems of caring for and living with biological diversity. One of the things that I also learned in that first work was that a lot of conservation organizations in the early 1990s were not listening to indigenous communities. Now, this is something that a lot of people in conservation biology and conservation ecology, conservation science in general, have worked on for two decades now, but it was a pretty major finding and I had some good empirical data that showed that people were not listening to what indigenous people want. So one of the other things that I thought about were the kinds of inequalities that emerged with these big international NGOs coming in and creating conservation areas. 
I wrote two books based on the work at Crater Mountain. The first one, Conservation is Our Government Now, is specifically about the Crater Mountain Wildlife Management Area. And the second one is tied to that in some ways, because one of the things that the conservation organizations that were working in the Crater Mountain area didn't notice was that everybody there grew coffee, that the main livelihood strategy for every single person who was hunting, who was using resources from the rivers, who was, you know, growing garden foods, garden, um, gardens, full of food, that they were also growing coffee for the market. And so I wrote a book about coffee. I can talk about both of those if you'd like. Conservation is our government now is a pretty searing critique of environmental conservation practice <clears throat> globally. And it's data driven by the work in the highlands of New Guinea. One of the things that came out of that was a lot of people read the book. A lot of American conservation ecologists got pissed off at me and don't talk to me anymore about it. But a lot of Papua New Guinea ecologists and a lot of people who actually work in Papua New Guinea said, OK, this is really interesting. We can learn from this. And you know, my intent with that first book really was to contribute to the process of the conservation of biodiversity globally. People in Papua New Guinea read the book and they thought, OK, this is a great critique, but what are we going to do about it? What are your suggestions for how we actually do something different? And so I was lucky enough after writing that book to get invited to collaborate with a number of young Papua New Guinean scientists, two of my colleagues from the United States, to create something called the Papua New Guinea Institute of Biological Research. PNGIBR does not exist anymore. We can talk about why in the question and answer period. But for about a decade, we were this incredible organization that had at its premise that the way to foster biodiversity conservation in the highlands of Papua New Guinea and across Papua New Guinea was to make sure that Papua New Guineans actually had the tools that they needed to become the people working in conservation. At the time, there were very few young Papua New Guineans who were leaving the country to get masters and PhDs. And at the time, there was no PhD program in anything connected to environmental management or conservation in the country. And so this organization worked to take the best and brightest students from Papua New Guinea, kind of top up their university education, get them ready to compete internationally for masters and PhD scholarships, support them while they were doing their masters and PhDs, and then provide them with avenues to employment when they got back to the country. And we were wildly successful. Some of the folks that are doing the most important work in conservation today came through our project. It also was something that brought together researchers from across the world onto a campus in Goroko, which is the capital of the Eastern Highlands province, to really think about what can conservation that is ethical, what can conservation that is driven by local needs and concerns, what can that look like? Because of that collaboration early in my career, um, I started thinking about, well, wouldn't it be nice to collaborate in other ways? And to just step back for a second here, anthropologists are crap collaborators. We are actually a field that does not value collaborative work in the way that say conservation science values collaborative work. There's still a kind of ethos in cultural anthropology, especially that you go out to the field as an individual, you do your research on your own, you produce your knowledge, you write your monograph, you get your job, you get your tenure, and it's all about individual production. Now we all know that's not true. We know that every kind of Everything we do is collaborative when we work in places like Papua New Guinea and when we work all over the world. But anthropology still maintains this kind of myth of individual scholarship. So one of the things that I did when I got tenure was decide that I would never do a project on my own again. I would actually push back against this problem in my discipline. Because of the work with PNG IBR, because I wanted to collaborate with people, and because I really wanted a marine site, I ended up going to New Ireland province and I met this guy, John Eine. So John is the founder and director of Islands Awareness, which is a small marine-based conservation organization in New Ireland. John has an interesting story. He grew up in New Ireland and he and one of his cousins and his brother had worked for conservation organizations for a very long time. John is a fisheries management specialist. He was trained at the National Fisheries College, as was his brother and as was their cousin, Michael. 
So these three guys, after they had their training, they learned how to do all of this incredible conservation work, management work. They, um, John is an expert diver. He's one of the people that did the kind of baseline studies to look at the beach to mirror industry. And when we figured out that it was collapsing, it was work that John did that helped people understand that collapse. But so we worked for years for these big international organizations that were doing research on marine diversity and thinking about marine conservation. When John and I met in 2007, I guess, 2007, um, when John and I met in 2007, I was frustrated by having written this book about big international NGOs and not seeing any changes. John was frustrated about because he had worked with these big international NGOs and he saw this mismatch between what they wanted to do and what local people wanted to do. John was put in this position of kind of being a culture, culture broker. He was a person that was always asked to translate between what the locals want and need and what the conservation organizations want and need. And he really thought that the conservation organizations weren't listening to local people, which was something that I had found in my first research. We hit it off and became fast friends. And at that first meeting, we decided that we might want to do some work together. We might want to think about conservation in New Ireland and what it might look like to do conservation differently there. I've always taken critiques of my work really seriously. And one of the critiques of my work that I've gotten from people that do the kind of work that you all do is, yeah, 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 you can critique us like crazy, but how do you do it better? Can you do it better than we do? And so John and I set out to say, well, maybe, maybe we can do it better. So where do we work? We work in New Ireland province, which is a marine province to the northern. So if you think about the island of New Guinea, split it in half by that international border, the eastern half, northern quarter, right above that is New Ireland province. It's a marine province, 150,000 residents, 18 different language groups. All of these languages in Papua New Guinea, how does everybody speak to everybody else? There's a Creole language called Melanesian Pidgin. And so almost everybody in the country who is under about the age of 50, I would say speaks this language. It depends on where you are, how rural you are, but that's the Creole language that people communicate in. And our work in New Ireland, I speak Melanesian Pidgin, so that's what I use. In the Highlands, I spoke Gemi, which is one of the indigenous languages. John speaks two of these different languages, and so we work in multiple languages. Below at, at the bottom of the slide, you see some of the New Ireland um, island groups, so it's made up of lots and lots of different islands. When most conservation organizations see New Ireland, this is what they see. They see staggeringly, staggeringly important marine biodiversity, they see coral systems that are under threat from various kinds of things. They see potential for tourism that is going to drive money into the economy. They see the kinds of things that we think about when we think about marine diversity globally. John and I wanted John and I wanted to step back from that a couple of minutes and think about, okay, what do people here see when they see biodiversity or when they see when they see New Ireland. And so we did a massive multi-year survey before we did any kind of work together. And that survey gave us these results. These are the things that people in New Ireland are concerned about in this order, descending order. Food security, resource extraction that has to do with logging and oil palm plantations, resource extraction that has to do with mining. Things that we class as climate change, even though people in our survey may not have called it that. And then the loss of culture. But the most important things that people identified were local livelihoods. A huge number of people in island Melanesia across the Pacific depend on fish, fish and food from the reef that they catch themselves for their subsistence. So stop for a second and think about colonialism. And I'm gonna talk about our decolonial method. There are a lot of white people talking about colonialism and decolonialism right now. And I think we need to think really carefully before we think we're gonna decolonize anything. You see in front of you something that you already know, but I wanna remind you of that the reach of colonialism was across the planet. It was swift and it was total. When I think about decolonial method, I think about three people that I learned from. One is Linda Smith, Linda Smith's book, Decolonizing Methodology. If you have not read it, you should get it, read it right now. It's kind of a Bible for thinking about what does it really mean to do decolonial research. One of the things that John and I came together with when we read this book was we really understood clearly from her work 
that all work that we were going to do needed to start from a community concern, that there might be lots of concerns that he and I had that we had identified about the loss of biodiversity, but what were communities worried about? What kinds of changes were they seeing? And what kinds of things did they want to mitigate? And that's really where our collaboration starts. We also learned from Partha Chatterjee, who you should read if you haven't read. And then we've learned over the years from Zora Neale Hurston, I put this slide up because this is a reasonably new book. There's a lot of discussion today about the legacies of slavery. This is a book that was her last book. It's, it was published after her death, obviously. And it's a narrative, it's an oral history of the last living slave in the United States who she interviewed. Okay, so when we think about colonialism, we have to think about it in terms of massive extractive sovereign power, but power that reorganized the lives of the colonized and reorganized ecological conditions in the colony. Also power that produced knowledge, produced knowledge about race, nature, culture, the universal, the particular, and ideas about unilinear evolution. The other thing that we've really been driven by in our work in terms of thinking about decolonial methods is this argument that Tuck and Yang make that decolonization is not a metaphor, that decolonization really does mean specific things. They say in North America, decolonization means giving the land back. And for us, that made us think, well, what about Papua New Guinea, where 97% of the land is owned by the indigenous people? The land doesn't need to be given back. What are the legacies of colonialism? What are the history, structures, processes, forms of power, forms of relations that come from the colonial moment? So we began to think about this in terms of all of the different forms of colonial extractive power that existed in New Ireland. You see them up on your screen. And we came up with our collaborative process that we think of as a decolonial process. We think of fostering grounded knowledge. We think of fostering self-determination. And we do that through listening, mobilizing, and researching. And I'll tell you a little bit about our projects. But I want to stop for one second and show you this slide. Um, sadly, we lost my my Cornelius. He was one of our elders. These are two things that Cornelius said, uh, the first one in 2017, the second one in 2019. So the first one, the separation of the forest and the reef is colonial. It's not ours. The separation of environmental knowledge from what is spiritual is colonial, and it's not ours. And then secondly, to feed our families in the future, we must understand our past, what was lost and return to it and return it and to it. And we really have taken these two things that Cornelius sums up perfectly to develop this methodology that we have. So what's the first thing that we do? John and I work together with 12 communities across New Ireland province, and we have small areas that you all might call conservation areas, but that we call valle areas. And the reason that we don't use the language of conservation anymore is because conservation is inherently something that is tied to a particular knowledge history, a particular kind of the production of knowledge about the environment that we all know for a very long time edited out the indigenous people, <clears throat> the indigenous people who were stewards of those environments. We do this not just as a discursive move. We do it because people in New Ireland said, people come, they talk about conservation. We don't know what that means. We don't, they have these agendas from outside. We don't care about their agendas. To use this notion of vale, to use this idea that there's a connection between the reef, the land, and the ridge, that there's a connection between the past and the ancestors, the present, and how people have to feed their families right now and what they have to do get, to get by, and the future, both a future in terms of livelihood strategy, but also a future in terms of turning back and looking at the ancestors and having the ancestors look at you. Having the ancestors look at you. This is where we really are with our work. And so these areas that we have, these 12 valley areas, are areas where people have made decisions about changing the way that they're interacting with the biodiversity that they hold in stewardship. I'll give you one example. One of the areas that we work in is Lavangai. Lavangai is both the name for the big island of New Hanover, which is one of the bigger islands in the New Ireland group. Um, it's also the name of a village. And so we work on Lavangai in Lavangai. So folks in Lavangai came to John and I and said, so look, one of the things that we're really concerned about, we're concerned about the decline in fish on our reef. We see that there are young people who are fishing out of season. 
We see that there are people coming from other places. They're fishing on our reef. We see that there are people who are using Daris root, which is a kind of poison that is very destructive. You all know this, your conservation people, um, using what it's Daris roots called poison rope in New Guinea. There are all these things people are doing that are making our fish decline. We said, okay, so let's do some work. Let's do the science and figure out what's driving the decline. We did the work and turns out people knew exactly what was dri driving the decline. They had really good sort of, um, they had really good data that they had not collected in a systematic way, but they'd seen over time what was driving it. We collected really good systematic da data and said, yep, you're right. These are the things that are driving it. Here are some things that you might do to mitigate that decline. And we gave them a whole suite of things, scientific conservation management techniques, we gave them management techniques that had been used by big conservation organizations globally, no take zones, um, limited take zones, seasonal take zones, you all know this literature. And then we also said, there's this other thing that you used to do that you don't do anymore that might be kind of cool to try. And these are traditional fish traps, um, stonewall fish traps catch fish by virtue of their design. They're derived from knowledge of movement of fish over the reef flats. Trap is um, kind of a low fence uh, wall that's made on the reef. It's made from coral and rubble. They're built in a V shape and the bottom of the V points towards the reef's crest. They form this narrow opening that leads into a small kind of, and ours is not heart shape, but a small kind of enclosure. And each arm of the V is, is very long. Um, the ones that we have are very long. And the trap operates with fish entering into it and getting trapped in there. We told them, you guys used to do this. Paige has done the research. She's looked through the colonial records from the German. She's talked to people that worked with Hortense Powdermaker, who was one of the first anthropologists there. She's looked at Otto Finch's documents and all of his paintings. He was one of the first ethnographers there. She's talked to Dorothy Billings, who was the most important ethnographer of this place. She's looked at the uh, British records. She's looked at the Australian records. And she's also done a bunch of work to see how these fish traps works in other places in the Pacific. Here's a thing that you could do that was a traditional method for Vale, and you could combine it with some of these scientific methods. That's what the people in Lavangai have done. It's an incredibly successful site. Somebody's gonna ask me during the question answer question period, how do we measure success? Ask me that question. But that's one thing that we do and one example of our valley areas. One of the things that we've also noticed is that in order to do this work on valley or what you all would call conservation, <clears throat> We needed to think about revitalizing traditional leadership structures. There was a lot of discussion in that initial survey we did about the loss of culture and a lot of discussion subsequently with our elder advisors about what it means to even talk about the loss of culture and what it means to revitalize tradition in a place where there are all these different language groups. So one of the things that we've done is create a group of elders, a group of elders, men and women from across the province that we work with to think about what kinds of traditional leadership structures helped to maintain biodiversity over long periods of time in the past. And we've worked to revitalize those. One aspect of that is a Maligan project. So you should Google Maligan, don't do it right now, but Google it. So Maligan are these incredible sculptures that are made of wood that you will see in museums all over the world. Maligan is also a social system. It's a total social fact, if you know your Durkheim, that takes you from before you are born, before your parents imagine you, through when they conceive you, through when you're born, all through your life, to your death, and to you becoming an ancestor. Maligan is a system of rites and rituals. It's also a system of material objects. And Maligan is something that was both part of this traditional leadership structure. It's also something that is connected to making these intricate, beautiful carvings you see in museums. Some years ago, the last six living Maligan carvers came to John and I and said, look, you're doing all this interesting work with people and the things that they eat and the places that they live. You're doing this valet work. Can you do it for culture too? I stepped back as an anthropologist and said, no, 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 we don't do that. Culture shift and change. That's not something I want to be part of. And then the elder said to me, so 
the whole thing that you say to us all the time is it's what we want that matters. It's not what you want that matters. And I said, yep, that's right. Absolutely. And so John and I started working with these elders to think about how to revitalize Maligan tradition. And we've done this in a couple of different ways. And we've learned some really interesting things about the relationship between Maligan and biodiversity. So Maligan carvings exist in museums all over the world. We worked with a group of students from Columbia and a group of students from the University of Papua New Guinea to create a digital archive that is housed on iPads that were donated by the Tao Foundation. These iPads have the digital archive. They also have the capability to add notes to that archive and to add voice memos to that archive. We took those iPads and we set them free. They are free in New Ireland, roaming around. We see them, we did this in 2014. We see them all the time. I'll be in town sometimes in caving the capital. I'll see an old guy with one of the iPads. He will say, I got it from this person, this person, this person. We were not smart enough to put a chip in these to be able to GPS them and find out where they've gone. But they have really circulated around the island, circulated the way that knowledge, or the islands, the way that knowledge circulates. People have been adding to them. People have been using them to get kids excited about Maligan. People have been using them to say, okay, so what do you remember? What do you remember? And if you think, if there are people in the audience who are anthropologists, you think about Frederick Barth, Barth's really early work where he looked at the way that ritual knowledge moved over time in New Guinea. And one way that it moves is through people knocking on somebody's door and saying, hey, so we forgot how to do this thing. Do you remember how to do this thing? That's what these iPads have done. They've made people have these conversations. The other thing that we've done through this with these master carvers is start six carving schools where the master carvers can pass on the techniques to young people that are interested. Passing on the techniques is complicated because the techniques and the motifs on the carving are cultural property and they're cultural property because they encode knowledge not just about biodiversity in general, they encode knowledge about specific places and specific kinds of things that we would call symbiotic relationships between plants and animals, between animals and other animals. So they encode all of this knowledge about the environment. So this is a project that we thought was something that was kind of like, oh yeah, people want to help us, want us to help them revitalize this cultural tradition. Yep, okay, we'll do that. That's not really what we do. Turns out this is incredibly important for biodiversity. The other thing that we've done connected to knowledge transfer is we founded a thing called the Robiana Saltwater School. The Saltwater School is what we would call in North America, basically a summer camp. Um, it's a camp where kids K through 12 come in groups for a week or two weeks at a time. And what they do is work with both scientists who are working on a particular taxa or a particular question or a particular project and elders who we've called in to work with that scientist. So the kids do these incredible learning experiences where they see that nexus of indigenous knowledge and scientific knowledge. And what we hope is that we're fostering a generation of young people in the province who don't see a divide between those two kinds of seeing, understanding, narrating, and making the world. We also hope that we have lots and lots of budding scientists. One of the things that we have been bad at, which is kind of crazy given that I run one of the preeminent feminist centers, um, probably in the United States, definitely at uh, Columbia University uh, that focuses on gender and equity, is that John and I have not been great about gender and equity in New Ireland. Some years ago, um, the woman in the picture here came to us and said, well, came to me and said, so basically you do all this work, all this work on Vale, you do all of this work around Maligan and you don't pay any attention to everything that's happening behind the scenes. So I said that we've been really focused on that relationship between ritual and biodiversity and people's futures and past. And all of that ritual is elaborate. So ritual in New Guinea takes multiple days. There's lots of tarot. There's lots of pigs killed. There's lots of garden food. There's lots of exchange. And Secunda, the person in the picture, was right. I had not paid attention to all of the labor that went into that on the part of women. I had noticed it, but I hadn't attended to it. I hadn't said, OK, for all of this work around biodiversity to happen in the front of the house, to use Gothman's term, what's happening in the back of the house? 
And so we have a new project now funded by Synchronicity Earth, which many of you know because it's a British organization, to begin to think about with women elders and young women, how do we work on revitalizing an interest in this kind of women's relationship to biodiversity? So our collaborative process extends to many. It's not just John and I collaborating. We collaborate with fishers. We collaborate with elders. We collaborate with the government. We collaborate with students, both international students and non-international students. And we also collect, we are, John calls us promiscuous and he finds it quite hilarious when he does because um, he knows exactly what it means and the connotations. He says that we are promiscuous collaborators. We will collaborate with anybody as long as that collaboration is something that is generated by the communities that we work in. They have a question about something. We reach out to the world and say, okay, so we're not experts on this. An example of this is a place called Panacaeus where people saw a decline in sandfish, which are incredibly important for them economically. I don't know anything about sandfish. John's not an expert on sandfish. We got somebody from the University of Queensland who is an expert to come and collaborate with us. So our promiscuous collaboration allows for people to actually get what they need in terms of information about how to do what they want to do with their biodiversity. The other thing that we really thought quite a bit about is a process that we think of as stepping up and stepping back. So I said that John and I had both really come from the beginning of our careers, noticing that a lot of external actors focused on conservation were not doing a lot of listening. We all know this. We all understand the constraints that people have. We understand that if you're doing conservation globally, there are certain things that you can get money for and certain things that you can't get money for. We know that there are certain questions that the global conservation community is asking and that that drives a lot of science. We really believe though that to do this in situ work that every collaboration has to start with listening and learning what people there want. And then we believe that offering support of very varied kinds is what we should do as people who have access to power. So this is John without a shirt on um, and with the glasses. And this, this is a picture of him in some of the ritual wear. He's a Mai Mai, he's someone who's been initiated in multiple different um, different kind of my my systems. He's a very important politician in the area. In the end, he is a person with incredible power. And I, because of my privileged position at Columbia, am too. We use that power. We follow Gibson Graham here. We use that power from the institutions we're connected to to offer support. We facilitate. And then John and I remove ourselves. And this is something that is not for the young scholars in the audience because you know, there's a way in which as a young scholar, you can't really remove yourself because you have to write about things, you have to publish, you have to do all of this work in order to solidify your career. So this is for the more senior of my colleagues in the audience. One of the things that I have really struggled with over the years is my role in terms of publishing about this work that we do. We do incredible work. And I would love to publish all kinds of things about it. But in the end, I've decided that I want young Papua New Guineans to do the publishing about this work. And so removing myself in that way. The other way that we remove ourselves is when these communities we work with have their plans in place, we step back and say, you know, if you need help from us, come to us, but we're not gonna bother you every day. And that is both good and bad. You can ask me questions about that. There are lots of intersections with the work that we do and the work that big conservation organizations do. We certainly still collaborate with them. We have some pretty serious critiques of them still, but we have a kind of sense that people are trying to do good work in the world and that we are again willing to collaborate with almost anybody, almost anybody. And this is one of my last slides. And this is a slide that always makes John uncomfortable, but it is a slide that I think is incredibly important in forums like this. You know, white people need to be able to talk about racism. We need to be able to talk about colonial legacies. We need to be able to talk about all of this without getting upset. The only way to really decolonize is to have these difficult dialogues. I've written about this in my most recent book, Dispossession and the Environment, which I would love for you all to read if you have any interest in it. And with that, I will say thank you very much. Um, this is John and I very early on in our collaboration. But thank you so much for listening to me talk about our work.
Um, thank you, Paige. Thank you for the great presentation. Um, now, as I mentioned in the chat, anyone who has any questions, uh, you can please write them in the in the chat box, and I'll, I'll make sure to ask um, Paige directly. And just to, to mention something you mentioned during your presentation, Paige, where you said that um, anthropologists are all, um, very often um, criticized for not offering solutions and how conversation should happen. This is another thing that came up during this networking session with Joe Elliott from Flora and Fauna International, who's another contributing factor to thinking that we need someone who can offer more of a constructive, of course, like criticizing is also very important of, of how conservation happens, but the other side of the argument seems to be more rare. And so thank you very much for presenting case studies for this as well. And um, until I'll a question I'll is asked, um, I'd like to ask one first. And um, it is a rather broad question on, um, both in your research and in today's presentation, you have mentioned that um, conservation has been, um, the way it's happening has been dominated to a certain extent by the West um, and how we disassociate the environment from um, the urban environment or societies. Um, so I was wondering in a, in a world where we need to conserve large areas of land and waters throughout the world, when we need the standardized system to know when we're succeeding in conserving, when we're not, when we're falling behind, when we're not. How do you think um, indigenous communities and their values and their culture can be involved in the process of designing a system that allows us to conserve enough land to, to make a, an impact as the international targets has been set out? Or do you think these are wrong from the beginning? So I think some of the international targets need to be reassessed. I mean, I think the 30 by 30 business is incredibly problematic. I think that, I mean, and I start from a position of thinking that we're, we're in trouble. We've been in trouble for my entire lifetime. And so I'm certainly not saying that we don't need international solutions, but I think that a lot of these international solutions, more people need to be brought to the table than the people that are just at the table right now. In terms of how indigenous people can be involved in this, I think that there is an assumption. I mean, this is one of the reasons that John and I work on that, um, the Roviana Saltwater School. I don't like kids, kids are not my bag. I don't wanna hang out with five-year-olds. That is not interesting to me, however, I believe that there's a way in which indigenous voices have been relegated to the notion of indigenous knowledge and not to a seat at the table with these kind of discussions about how to conserve these massive areas. I think that you have negotiators at the level of the UN who are indigenous, but they're working on multiple platforms. I think the more indigenous people in these conversations, but I also think more people that are the unusual suspects, right? I mean, there was a study recently about anthropologists and I believe it is that 80% of anthropologists have parents with PhDs. 80% of anthropologists in the United States have parents with PhDs. We need more scholars that don't come from those traditions. I'm a first generation college student and I do think that my perspective as someone who grew up achingly poor actually gives me a different kind of perspective. So I think we need a diversity, and I don't use that term in the banal way that it gets used in the United States to think about metrics. I think we need difference. I think we need a lot of people from a lot of backgrounds having these conversations about how we're gonna meet the needs of the sick, you know, the sick planet. I think we also need to think really carefully about how we train PhD students. I'm um, lucky enough to be involved with the creation of our climate school. I'm heading up the task force that's gonna think about our new interdisciplinary PhD program. And I think one of the key things is that you should not get out of an anthropology program that does environmental anthropology without taking some classes about, about planetary environmental issues. I think that you shouldn't get out of a conservation related program without thinking about environmental justice. So I think this interdisciplinary work can also help with your, the kinds of things you're asking. And thank you very much for your uh, question. I'll now, uh, answer, sorry. I'll now move on to the questions that we have uh, received from uh, the audience in the chat. And I'll, since your presentation stressed a lot um, the need for collaboration, so I'll jump to Andrew Paul's question. And he's asking, so he's interested in learning more about your work to support capacity building for indigenous leadership in conservation, particularly the PNG Institute for Biological Research and the Associated Scholarship Programs. And he's wondering what happened to the Institute and what advice would you give for those of us who are interested in fostering similar collaborations with the communities with whom we work? Right, and that was from Andrew. Andrew, thank you very much. That's a great question. So the first thing I would say is that 
I have tried to rid myself of the, the language of capacity building, um, shoot me an email and I will send you a PDF of my last book. I have a whole chapter about the language of capacity building and what that assumes and what it specifically assumes in places like Papua New Guinea. But you know, PNG IBR was this incredibly successful, incredibly wonderful organization. A couple of things happened to us. One thing that happened is that all the folks who came back from getting their PhDs and getting their master's degrees wanted to work on the ground in conservation. They wanted to work on the front lines. They wanted to do really good science. They wanted to do really good community collaboration. They did not want to manage a conservation organization. And so we did not do a good job of thinking about the operations cost in terms of how do you get people that are really dedicated to the mission of indigenous sovereignty over conservation, but who don't want to be field researchers. And so we had, we had a very difficult time finding good managers. We were really set that we wanted people from Papua New Guinea managing the organization. The, ma the majority of the people who founded the organization are from Papua New Guinea. Many of them stepped up and did management for a while, but it's not what they wanted to do with their careers. So that's one thing that happened. Another thing that happened was that to stay alive in um, as a small NGO in Papua New Guinea, to stay alive, you have to collaborate with large NGOs. Many times, not always, but many times, these large NGOs contract work that they don't have the ability to do to small NGOs. So for instance, they will go for a massive international grant. They will say that they can do a particular kind of biological survey in the highlands of Papua New Guinea. They can't really do that because they don't have the human power on the ground. They don't have the ability to do that work. They contract the small NGO. They don't pay people a living wage. They don't pay operations costs. We got caught up with one of these big organizations that had that sort of model and the shit hit the fan and it hit the fan in a way that bankrupted us. And so we are kind of, we think about it as dormant. It may come back. Many of my colleagues in PNG, I was just, uh, for people in the audience who know PNG, I was just emailing with Muse Openg today. We're thinking about, can we revitalize it? But that's what happened with it. Advice that I would give to people interested in fostering similar collaborations in the communities where you work is that, you know, there are a lot of models of best practice here. The American Museum of Natural History Center for Biodiversity Conservation has some things on their website that I would look at. I would look at folks like Neoterra who I have a lot of time for. You know, they're kind of CI, they're they're mostly CI guys who are now working at Neoterra, but Chris Filardi, who founded it, I think the world of, I think they're doing amazing work. So what I would do is look at models of collaboration and then reach out to people. You know, I will talk your ear off about collaboration. So will absolutely every other person who's done it in the world. And so really kind of be an anthropologist in this, collect some, collect some ethnographic data through interviews about what's worked for people. And that's, that's what I think you should do. Um, hi, uh, thank you very much uh, for this answer. And uh, now the next question is, um, uh, during your work, how have you approached possible questions on the introductions of new technology and tools? What questions you may have had and how have you dealt with those? Uh, for instance, with these iPads for the Malagan side, their data, sorry. So there are interesting questions about technology and um, technology and fishing in New Ireland. And I think you're not asking questions about that. I mean, one of the things that we're seeing across New Ireland is that with increase in increases in technology for fishing, people are overfishing more. Um, but I think you're asking more about technologies that might allow people to engage in new ways with biodiversity. Um, with the iPads, we had, we had gone to, I had gone to, and then John had been in contact with this person who works at the Auckland University of Technology. And AUT has this wonderful language program and they're thinking about revitalizing Cook Island languages. So the Cooks have multiple languages and their languages that are falling into disuse. This is happening all over the world, as you know. But AUT came up with these incredible programs for, for iPhones where it got kids excited in learning indigenous languages. And I went to this presentation. This person was here at the UN. I met them. I was blown away by their work. John talked to them. And what we realized was that this technology 
is one of the things that is going to draw young people in to being interested in both biodiversity and into what their elders know. You know, I won't put the picture back up, but the picture that you saw on that iPad slide, the Maligan slide, that was a day that we delivered the iPads to this one village called Bowl. It's on the east coast of New Ireland. We sit down with the iPad and the master carver. We're kind of going through things. And people start kind of gathering around. It's technology. It's a village. You know, if you've worked in villages, you know anything that is not the day-to-day -day people are interested in. We sat there for a long time. The people that were just interested in, you know, wow, there's something new went away. People stayed, though. A lot of young people stayed. The master carver's wife sat down and she takes the iPad and starts flipping through the pictures from the American Museum of Natural uh, History. She's looking at the Otto Finch collection, which Boaz bought from Finch and brought back to the AMNH. And she sees a Maligan that is from her father's family and she knows the person who carved it. So she knows the old man, he was a great grandfather when she was a young woman who carved that carving. She was able to tell us the story there. So Maligan has five layers that you can read. Um, I won't go through them all. The first three we can all read. The fourth one you can't read unless you really know the place. The fifth one is a sacred layer that you can only read if you're a master carver. Unless you're a master carver's daughter, which she was, she could read that, that fifth layer. Um, so Amalgam is a carving and it's a text. It's like wampum if you know the, if you know the work on material culture in North America. Um, she could read that Maligan in a way that probably very few people alive could still read it. Those kids were so excited about that. We watched this transformation through that technology of people who were disinterested in what their grandfather did, the old man as a grandfather of the master carver, to becoming incredibly interested in it. And two of those young men in the picture are in the carving school now. So I think there's a way in which technology can be incredibly useful. I think there are critiques of technology and conservation to be made for sure. But the way that we've used it, I think, has been really, really interesting. Perfect. Thank you for that answer, Paige. Um, I'll move on to a question by Alison Beresford. And she's asking, have you encountered any conflicts between revitalizing traditional leadership structures and gender equality? If so, how have you handled those? Yes, lots and lots of conflicts. So an important thing to say about New Ireland is it's matrilineal. And it's matrilineal. It was traditionally matrilineal. Um, with Christianity and colonialism, the matrilineal system has broken down to some extent, but women had lots and lots of power in the past. They have not as much power today. Um, I think that the conflicts that we have seen in revitalizing tradition and kind of thinking about gender equality are because a lot of the men that we've been working with, the elders, because they are both in their cultural milieu and their elders in the Catholic Church or the Lutheran Church, that there's a kind of importation of Christian notions of the, the family relationship um, and what it should be and women's roles that get imported into discussions about what kinds of things women should have access to. And we have complicated conversations about that. You know, John is a practicing Catholic and he's someone who's a believer. And um, he and the bishop and I have very interesting conversations about what is tradition in terms of women's roles and what is Catholic tradition in terms of women's roles. One of the things that I've had to do that's been, this is Allison's question, right? Allison, that's been really hard for me as, you know, a feminist scholar from the United States who's 50 years old, you know, I was trained in a very particular kind of feminist practice. And part of that is always focusing on calling out gender inequality. And I've had to learn sometimes to keep my mouth shut. I've had to learn sometimes to say, I mean, a perfect example is one year our intern, interns, uh, UPNG interns, we had five women, five men. I came home one day and all the women were like cooking dinner for the men and they were cleaning and they were doing their laundry. And I lost my mind. I lost my mind. I was just like, if you girls, don't want to be equal to them. You don't want to get PhDs. You don't want to go through this program. You should just go home. And John pulled me aside and he said, so these kids are actually enacting traditional gender roles from the places that they're from across New Guinea. And what you've just done is tell them that those are not valuable while we're trying to teach them 
that tradition and valet and all of this is valuable. So I've had to, I've had to really step back and kind of think about my own biases. Well, very impressive example. Uh, thank you, thank you, Paige. Um, I'll move on to a question by Helen Schneider, and she's asking, can you talk a little bit, um, I know you engage a bit in your answer with younger generations, um, and she's asking, can you talk a little bit about whether and how you work with a younger generation who may not desire a future remote rural areas, either, either as farmers or as conservation scientists? Yeah, I mean, I think, Helen, that you really hit the nail on the head of one of the big questions. There's a push for people to want to be in urban areas. Um, but you know, and this is, I think, a, a more complicated question than I have time to answer. I'll say two things. One is that in the highlands where I've worked, it's a different story than on the coast. On the coast, most people want to retain a deep connection between their natal village and working in a more urban area. There are a few urban areas on the big island of New Ireland. Another urban area that people have their sights set on is Loringal, which is um, Manus. And people really wanna maintain that balance. I think that there is a gender difference here. I think that young men that we talk to have a real sense that there is something to be gained from working for logging companies, mining companies, working for oil palm companies. And young women don't have that same sense that there's something to be gained from it. In the Highlands, um, it's way more complicated for me. The place that I work in the Highlands, I, you know, I go to New Guinea every year except for COVID years. And the last time I was there was 2019. I was back in the villages I worked in from my PhD in 2019 in the Highlands. And I was really struck by how the guys that I had done some pretty formal interviews with in 2014 and 15, that at the time were in their early 20s, were living in Garoka, the capital city, were thinking, we're never gonna go back to the village, we're not interested in that lifestyle. All of them were back in the village and they had really made the decision to go back home. And so I think that, um, I think it's complicated, Part of that complication is there's not a lot of wage labor in urban areas in Papua New Guinea. And so folks that do move to urban areas often live there in settlements and don't actually have access to the kind of wage labor that you need to build a life in an urban area. And this is different in other parts of the world, obviously. Thank you. And um, as we have more questions than we have time to answer. And um, so I will move with one more question. Uh, but before that, I would like to remind everyone in the audience that next week, um, this conservation seminar series is hosting Professor Milin Tambe from Harvard University, who will be presenting research on AI for wildlife. So it's again, same time, sorry, in two weeks, it's uh, on the 2nd of June. Um, so yeah, and without further ado, I'll move on to the last question for today, which comes from um, Chris, Chris Sandbrook. And it's a question that relates to a lot of the work that we do at CCI um, here in the university. And the question is, um, so the University of Cambridge and many of the conservation organizations within CCI have a long and problematic history in terms of colonialism and conservation. What advice would you give to us as we start the journey towards decolonizing conservation? So two things. One that's not an answer to this question. Can you send me an invitation to the next seminar? I have an amazing PhD student who's an anthropologist who works on AI and conservation and he should come to that seminar. Um, yeah. Okay, Chris. Chris, that's the question, right? I mean, I would argue that all conservation has that problematic history. And so the entire field of conservation science and conservation practice needs to really do a deep dive into the history that you're talking about to understand. I did a presentation last night for some very wealthy donors to a good conservation organization to try to get them to start to begin to think about why colonization matters. And so one thing I would say is that do that deep dive historically. The other thing is start teaching classes that ask these questions. Start collaborating with people around the university who work on the colonial history of the place that you work in. Teach classes to undergraduates and to graduate students because then you're gonna learn this history in new ways. And I'm not looking for a job, although I'd love to leave my job, but hire somebody like me. You know, hire somebody at CCI that does this kind of work that is dedicated to thinking about, okay, how do we imagine a future of this practice 
that is incredibly important that everything depends on. And I really do, for all my critiques of conservation, everything depends on us getting this right. Hire somebody who understands that, but understands that with a really critical eye and thinks about, okay, how do we do this work in situ? The other thing that I've been thinking about a lot lately, because I get asked to give these talks to donors pretty often for conservation organizations, because a lot of people that work in conservation organizations understand that there needs to be a decolonial conversation. A lot of donors think, well, what the colonial period's over. What do you mean? We don't need to talk about that. But one of the things I've been thinking about is how to talk to people about the inability to scale up and scale out sometimes. I had that slide that said, you know, so we have to think about New Ireland specifically when we think about colonialism. We have to think about Oceania. We have to think about New Guinea. We have to think, right, that slide. I think that thinking really in situ about, okay, what are, what are the things that we can see, the structures that we see today that are connected to this colonial history? How do we understand those structures? How do we talk to people on the ground about whether those structures are working for them or not? I think that work is really important work and that's a methodology. So I think we can scale methodology up and out, but I think we really have to think carefully about scaling solutions up and out. And that's one of the reasons that I have such a problem with the 30 by 30, because I think that scaling a solution that works in some places up and out in a way that is neo-colonial. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paige, for today's seminar, um, for, for this great presentation. Um, for those of you who, um, I know we didn't get through all the questions. Um, I'm sure Paige is happy to be contacted by email and answer them because there have been quite a few. We didn't oh, get here's, here's the thing though. I'm happy to be contacted by email this week I am taking the month of June off. I am going in my kayak and disappearing because this year has been just horrific. And so um, email me this week or email me in July, but I'm more than happy to talk to people via email 100%. I would love to answer any other questions you have. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, um, Paige. And as we mentioned, two weeks we have another seminar and um, we'd love to see you there. Um, it's great to see so many people join today's seminar. Um, and thank you everyone for joining. Um, have a great evening. And thank you again, Paige. Um, thank you.